we looked at rest template as a way to make calls to other microservices like that's the inbuilt way of um, calling those apis spring comes with rest template and says hey this is this client which you can use for uh, making any rest calls it doesn't have to be microservices uh, but like I talked about in the previous uh, workshop, this template is going to be deprecated soon. I don't know if it's soon. At some point of time, it's going to be deprecated. And there is an alternative which is called web client. You're not going to see a lot of usages of web client today, but that's I believe that's going to change. You'll see more and more people using web client. For the purposes of uh, this workshop, what I'm going to do is introduce you to web client so that you, you are ready, you have that information when you do encounter it. But once we have introduced web client, we're going to take it out and put back REST template, because for today, that's probably the most relevant knowledge you need to have. So REST client is so that I get you guys prepared for the future that's coming up. right? Uh, web client is also a little bit more verbose than REST template. But then it also uh, has a completely different um, purpose. All right, so this is REST template, right? This single line is making a call to the API and unmarshalling the object. Now, what if I want to do this using web client? The way to use web client is to use a certain class web client.builder. And if you can notice here, it says red because it's this particular class does not exist in the class path. Right? The reason it doesn't exist in the class path is this is actually in the reactive programming space of the Spring Boot uh, ecosystem. You know, when you build a Spring Boot application, you can build it the traditional way, which is step one, step two, step three, it's sequential, versus the reactive way, which, is, uh, which deals with the, the flux objects and the mono objects. Right? We don't have to go too much into reactive now, but you need to understand that Web client is in the in that space, you know, in that path. So you're going to be dealing with a lot of asynchronous uh, mechanisms of programming. So when when it comes to asynchronous, the idea is let's compare it with synchronous. What's happening in this line? You're saying, "Hey, REST template, give me the object," and you wait around till REST template gives you the object. The next line, the immediate next line, you know that REST template has done its job. But with asynchronous programming, that's not true anymore. You have API calls, which basically set things in motion. And then you go on your way and do other stuff. All right? So you basically tell web client, go make this call. And then you go do other stuff. You don't wait around for it. Then you might be wondering, well, how do I get that data back? Well, when you, when you set things in motion, not only do you tell it what to do, you also give it a lambda and say, once you're done executing whatever you're executing, run this lambda for me. And in that lambda, you have code about what needs to happen when that is completed. All right? So you're still not waiting around, but you're still providing instructions about what needs to happen. You're just not doing it in the line below that previous call. You're basically creating a function and passing it to that asynchronous call in addition to what the work needs to be done. All right? So let's replace this with a web client now. First step is to get those libraries into the class path. All right. So if you open Spring Initializer and uh, type web, you see there is this other option here called Reactive Web. Reactive Web comes with Netty and uh, Spring Web Flux, and then Spring Web Flux is that part of the Spring framework which has all these classes. So if we had added this when we created our Spring Boot project, we would have had this in the class path by now, and we could have been able to just do alt enter and import the class, but we didn't add that. So the first thing we need to do is add that to the pom.xml. So I'm going to open pom.xml and uh, copy this web dependency, and then change this to I'm going to save, and uh, Maven is going to do its thing and import it. And now I'm able to have it import. You see this? This is coming from web reactive 
blah 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 so it's from the reactive side of things web client dot builder is a builder well it's the builder pattern and you use it to build a client anytime you need to make a call you did something similar with rest template you just created a new instance of rest template right that was your builder quote unquote builder you built a new instance and then used it uh, in multiple calls in your application but with this one you're going to use the builder right let's call it builder webclient.builder, all right? So this is what gets you the builder. You create a builder, and then from that builder, you're gonna be, every time you need to make a call, you create a new client, put in the parameters you need, and then you say go, all right? So this is kind of equivalent to creating a new REST template. Not exactly, but you can think of it like that. What was that? Yes, yes, that's the obvious next step, right? You don't want to build a new web client every time a request comes in. The way it is right now, you're going to get a new instance every time you get a get catalog call. So the obvious next step is to move it and make it a bean. So since you asked, I'm going to do that right away. So let me move this here. Public web client dot builder. This is going to be the All right, now it's a bean. And now I can use this in my resource so that I don't have to do this here. How do I use this in the resource? I create an auto wired property, right? And this is it. I have an instance of web client builder that I can reuse no matter how many controllers I have, no matter how many APIs I'm calling, I can just use that same builder. Now this is the tricky part here. So this particular line is gonna be replaced by all the steps you need to do to make that call using web client builder. It's a little bit more elaborate than the single line that you're seeing here. So you basically do web client builder dot build, basically creating a new instance of a client every time you need to make a call. Next you specify the method that you need to call. Is it a get method or a put or a post? Here we're doing a get, right? Movie info, get. When you're doing a post, you do a dot post here, all right? And then on top of it, URI. What's the URL you need to call? Basically gonna copy this. and then I do a dot retrieve. I'm basically saying, okay, now that I've given you what the method is and what the URL is, I'm go do it, fetch me the data. And then I do a dot body to mono. If you don't know what mono is, you're probably gonna be confused by this step. Let me explain in a bit. And then I pass in the class and then I do a dot block this whole thing is going to give me an instance of movie right they deprecated this one and they're asking us to use this instead right go figure now i can introduce a local variable called movie and i have the movie information here Let's break this down. What are we doing here? Web client builder dot build is using a builder pattern and giving you a client, right? Next, you're using this chaining uh, mechanism in order to build on top of what you already have. The dot get says, I'm gonna do a get. This changes depending on the method, right? 
the URI is the URL that you need to access. In the case of a dot get, it's basically the same as the first argument in the REST template. Like, where do you need the request to be made? And then you say retrieve, like, oh, go do the fetch. And then body to mono is basically saying whatever body you get back, convert it into an instance of this movie class. So this is equivalent to the second argument in here, right? So this is the second argument. But what is mono? Body to mono. Anybody knows what mono is? No, it's like the object that you're getting back. Yes, yes. It's a, it's a reactive way of saying you're getting an object back, but not right away. You're going to get it sometime in the future. So a mono is kind of like a promise that this thing is eventually going to get you what you want. That's how we do asynchronous, all right? Don't worry too much about it if this is too confusing. Uh, we can do probably do another workshop on asynchronous if you guys are interested. But for now, just think of it as you're getting back an asynchronous object. It's not quite what you want, but it is in the future going to give you what you want, all right? Think of it as, um, I don't know how to give you an example about this. So think of it as like a, an empty page where y you know the message is going to show up over there, but you're basically given a container, an empty container, and then told that at some point of time, somebody is going to put something in there. So you have this empty container to hold on to, and then you can do stuff when something fills in. That's how we do asynchronous. You can now you have that container. You say, okay, I'm not going to wait around until this thing happens. I'm going to do something else. And then I'm going to keep checking this empty container. Well, not even keep checking the empty container. You'll say, hey, container, once somebody puts something in there, let me know. And then you can take action on that. Right? So that's kind of asynchronous uh, operation. But now here's the thing, though. This method, this API call, get catalog, is returning a list of movies. So you know that by the time this last line is executed in this method, you better have a list of movies. So no matter how you do this, asynchronous or synchronous, you have to wait around till you get that list of movies. And until you get that, you cannot get out of this method. There are alternatives to this. If you do the whole asynchronous route, you can have this method itself return a mono. So you're basically passing that empty container to Spring and saying, hey, I've done my job. This is what you need to return to whoever calls this API. Here's the empty container I'm handing it to you. Once somebody puts something in there, return it to the user who made this API call. You can technically do that, but we're not doing that now. We are telling Spring, we are, we are going to give you the thing. We're not giving you a container, right? So we're giving you a list of catalog items. So guess what? We have to wait around for this mono to return something back, which is this line. It's the block. We are blocking execution till that mono is fulfilled. And once we get that back, the result of the block is basically that mono container saying, hey, somebody put this thing in here. I know you're waiting around for me. This is what somebody put in my container, and it's going to give you. What is, it? what is that? It's a movie object. Because we've said we want this to be of type movie. All right? So with this, we get the movie back. So we're using asynchronous programming constructs. We're using asynchronous programming classes to do synchronous programming. Once you get the movie instance, I'm basically mapping it to a catalog item where I take the movie data out, the name and the description or whatever, and then put it into a catalog item. And this should work exactly like it did before. Right? Let's quickly test this out. Um, and once we make sure this works, I'm going to remove this code. We're going to go back to REST template, like I said. We're going to continue the rest of this workshop using REST template. There you go, same thing. Nothing changes because we are still doing the exact same thing and blocking around for that asynchronous operation. Okay, now what I'm going to do is comment this out and then uncomment this so that we're back to the REST template way. <laughs> 